Well, they're going to start on the back steps today. They will remove all of the pots, all of the gravel, all of that kind of stuff that is in the way. And then they'll start tearing out the existing concrete. And I know a number of you questioned my design on having the straight edge on the left side and the curve on the right. And I will explain my reasoning for that when we answer some Q and A's a little bit later. But most of the traffic getting in and out of the back door will actually be towards the west. And there will be easy ingress into the yard off of the steps in the center. This is not a large space, so I, like I said, I will go over my, my thinking for the placement of the steps and the straight edge versus the rounded edge. Right now, I am just happy that they're going to be making progress in getting the tear out done now that it has finally stopped raining. We're double checking our measurements now to make sure that it's on scale with what I want. I do think I want a small tree planted to the east or to the left as you're looking at it of the porch. So they're going to mark it off with spray paint for me because it looks different now that those nasty steps are removed. And speaking of white, here is, is a tip that I am definitely going to share with myself next year. In the past, the Minoan lace I have seeded in the fall or let it go to seed naturally. and this year because we moved i didn't really have any of it in place so i seeded it in the spring and because of all the rain this beautiful lacy white minoan lace is blooming later and it looks so dear with these other cottagey plants this may night salvia look at how the pollinators love it it's got all sorts of buds on it and it it's laciness, I think. It looks really, really beautiful with the glossy foliage of the better boxwood. And let me show you, you can see some more lacy mounds of it getting ready to start in there. And there are some more hidden amongst the crazy pink echinacea that are just blooming their heads off. I mean, those are just wonderful, a southern living plant. And then interestingly and happily, the celosia that I told you was kind of a creamy yellow white, it is starting to be less creamy and get more white, which is what I was hoping it would do. So as I as I show you it, let me point out to you another Minoan lace back here. It's actually scattered throughout the bed 
The pollinators just adore it. But you can see here that this celosia from my friend Gail is starting to turn more white and less yellowy and buttery. And it's that white that I am really, really desirous of right now. There's some more Minoan lace back in there. And I'm starting on a blog post. I haven't written a blog post in forever. But I'm starting on one, and, and the first line of it, of it is, nobody is more surprised than me that I ended up with a cottage garden at my second home. The other thing that I love is that all of these cottage bloomers, these self-seeding annuals, for a while they were really kind of just congested in this one area. But now you can see that in the distance, they are starting to wave at us as well, which tells me that they have spread and some of the smaller seedlings have started to grow up. It's so important and so entertaining to look at your garden from just all sorts of different vantage points. And I just keep adding more stepping stones so I can really get into the garden itself and do just that. I could not be more pleased with the way that all of the candy butterfly, butterfly candy, has taken off. and. It was hard for me to decide what my favorite variety or the favorite color was. Um, but I have to say that now that it's been blooming for a long time, and, and speaking of butterflies, look there. There's just, there's just so many of them. So not only are the Cleome waving to me this morning, but the butterflies are also giving me a nod of acknowledgement with their wings. But the one that I, I think I like the best in terms of performance maybe, oh look, there's another beauty over there, are the lavender ones, this right here in the center. The plant tends to get a little bigger and the cones, the cones tend to get a little bit bigger too. So it might be my favorite. And let me see if I can get a close-up shot. I need to do some deadheading, but look at the interior of the little individual flower heads. Look at that. Isn't that just gorgeous? So I will be out with my scissors doing lots of deadheading because the rain did diminish. Look at all of, this one is one that I deadheaded earlier. Look at all of the new flower buds on that. So you do have to stay on top of it. Now you don't have to do the deadheading, but I enjoy it. It makes it bloom more profusely and it improves the appearance, so why not? Now, I am not sure if Barbie pink is represented in here, but I'm gonna guess it is. But all of these pinks tend to have kind of a, a blue subtone to them. And so they, unlike some other pinks that might have more of a reddish hue or an orangey hue, these definitely all have blue tones to them. Even, it doesn't really communicate as well over the screen, but even the celosia with its kind of magenta flowers. And I'm looking forward to doing something with them later. Here's my question of the day. If you have had any experience working with celosia as a dried flower in crafts, or just, um, just as a cut flower, maybe in the fall, let me know. Flowers that not only look beautiful in the moment, but also look beautiful throughout the seasons.
This is, this is, I've mentioned it before, but this is what I love about this Cleome, is it just keeps getting taller and taller and taller with these spidery projectiles that come out of it. And then undaunted by the heat, the next morning at the very tippy top, it puts out these new beautiful petals and buds and at the end of the day it looks very tired but then in the morning it's just undaunted and it rewards us with more fresh blooms well it's hard to say goodbye to the cleome but nevertheless we have some lemon variegated thyme waiting over here for its time in the spotlight. And you can see that I have clipped it so it doesn't get too rangy. And here's an example of where I have, I have tucked just lots of the cuttings into the soil. And I have found this works rather brilliantly to start new tufts without having to bring them in and root them in water. Um, and there were enough cuttings that I was able to sprinkle it all along the perimeter of the patio in multiple locations. You can see I've added some more stepping stones in this area and you cannot see them from from the street. You cannot see them from sidewalk level. And yes, it is, it is very delicate walking in there, but nevertheless, it works. And of course, also, you know, throughout the seasons, I'm not always having to navigate my way through all of these, these tall beauties. A lot of times, um, there won't be as much in growth surrounding them. So I'll be able to navigate more easily. Now, one of the reasons that we took the drone shots in addition to being absolutely beautiful is that it it does i think show the design of it a little bit more specifically and it will also tell me when i examine some of the stills where i may need to introduce some more evergreens so that i will have enough evergreens on the upper terrace in the winter time and some of and there's an example right there, that large boxwood ball will stay evergreen, as will all of the little villages of boxwood tufts that I have surrounding the patio and the walkway. Um, but it's the interior that I want to be really mindful to, to make sure that I have enough evergreens in there. So it may be that I introduce more fire chief arborvita, uh, more boxwood, more cotoneester, that remains to be seen. And that's also something that when I am pulling out the annuals, which is, is this is a, a tip. When you're starting a new garden, obviously you are waiting for your shrubs and your investment pieces, your bones, the bones of your garden to mature and grow. Then you plant lots of annuals to fill in. In the meantime, I just prefer self-seeding annuals and, and tall um, cottagey type of annuals like the Larkspur and the Cleome and the Gumfrina and the Celosia versus a lot of bedding plants. But it's still the same principle. It's taking up space until the shrubs that I have planted mature and they consume more real estate. But over on this side, it, the point remains also, I wanna make sure that I will have enough evergreen structure in place. And I started to say that when I really notice that, uh, it will be prime planting time because it'll be in the fall after I have removed a lot of those annuals. And I'll be able to tell where I need to introduce some more winter interest. And that will give the garden a little bit more cohesion and maybe not look quite so busy. Though I have to say, I, it does look busy and it doesn't bother me a bit. Now I think 
why some people struggle with it and think, oh, it's just too much to have in a front yard is because I think there is a bias to having these kinds of gardens in front yards. Um, we're used to, if this were in the back, nobody I think would really care. But in the front yard, this is an unusual practice. It's not unusual in other areas of the country. My friend Patty was just telling me how in Portland, Oregon, all most of the front yards kind of look like this, at least in her, where her son lives, and certainly in Europe. Now, is it a practice for everyone? No, because you have to be not so like me. You have to love gardening so that you keep it well maintained and deadheaded so it looks presentable. But is it a much better alternative for all of these pollinators than just lawn? Absolutely. All of these little individual green islands out here they are all foxglove that I planted earlier in the season. And they're taking their time, but that's fine because I really don't want them to bloom until next year. Um, and they have enough room to grow without getting spider mite, which is a, a real problem, a, a real pest that tends to go after foxglove after they have bloomed, which is why typically a lot of times I cut them back after they bloom or pull them out. But these are fine because that's a secret. If you want something um, to be healthy without fungal problems, without uh, powdery mildew, without, you know, white fly or spider mite, then give them lots of good air circulation. Is it a guarantee? Absolutely not. But does it help tremendously? Absolutely, yes. And in answer to my decision-making process along here is I, I have decided to introduce another Miss Lemon Abelia in here and maybe a few more lemon limes to continue this. Now, it's gonna be gorgeous with that backdrop of the Encore Azaleas in there. You can see that they're already starting to grow up and some of them, that is Autumn Moonlight and these are gonna be spectacular and they will increase in size, like I say, tremendously. Now here's an answer to some questions you had. You said, oh, I noticed some tufts of blue in there. Are there other hydrangeas? And indeed there are, they're more protected. Um, these are deer Dolores. These are also a Southern living plant that blooms on new wood. And unlike the white weddings, they prefer a little bit more shade, which is why they're tufted in, tucked into the embrace of the white weddings so that they will get a little more protection. There's also a couple on the other side that at this point are getting a little too much sun, um, but that problem will be redressed as the plants around it mature. Now I think I had mentioned that I had some larkspur that was blooming very late, but look at how gorgeous it looks, kind of weaving and insinuating itself into those really delicate branches and the delicate white flowers of the Miss Lemon Abelia. And I have mentioned many times before that that lavender color, that lavender blue and chartreuse is one of my very, very favorite color combos. So that tells me that I probably, in addition to planting I think I'm gonna plant some light blue muscari along here to bloom in the spring. Though I'll, I'll, I will also wanna make sure to sprinkle lots of blue larkspur up and down Lemon Lane. And I will be ordering my tulips this week. My tulips and my spring flowering bulbs from Color Blends. Now this is a trick. If you're having a hard time getting your foxglove seeds to germinate, then plant them at the base of one of your container plantings. In this case, this is a green mountain boxwood. And I just scattered some seeds in there and look at how huge they've gotten. 
and then I will put them out this fall. I'll share some of them with my friend Gail because I have multiple pots that contain really large starts now of foxglove. So that's a little trick. If you're having something, having difficulty getting something to germinate in the ground that you want to plant out in the fall, then plant it at the base of a pot, of an evergreen in a pot where it's protected and it gets probably a little bit more moisture and has better drainage and has the protection of the primary resident of the container so it shelters the little seedlings. Here's another example of that. And while Columbine is not at all difficult to self-seed in the garden, unlike foxglove, this is another example of where it's gone to seed in the base of a plant, in this case, of this Eugenia. Now, unlike the other Eugenia topiaries that I planted in their pots into the ground, this one is in a very heavy concrete pot so I will take this one out, put it into a large plastic pot to overwinter in the greenhouse, and then I will plant something else, probably another true evergreen in that pot, so it will give me additional winter interest. And now to the back, the progress. That's loud. The progress on the back steps was definitely delayed because of the rain, but they're back at it. Say hello, guys. Hi. Hey, Junior, Enrique. They're, they are back here hard at it. And some of you had some questions about the east side of the steps, and it's going to be hard for me to explain right now. But once, once they're complete, I think you'll understand my, my design a little bit better. Some of you were concerned that more of the orientation was, was too much emphasized towards the garage and the west side and not the east side. But I'll show you how I'm getting around that, but also some of my rationale for why and how I, I think it will work out. A lot of you asked about my compost tumbler, and by the way, I've, I've put this on my favorites on Amazon. This is a mantis tumbler. Uh, their previous design of this, and it may still exist, was in metal. This one is in hard plastic, and it's just got grooves to turn it instead of a handle that could break off. So I love this one, and I've had it for years. And back hidden with all the mess is another topiary with lots of foxglove at the base. It's going to be foxglove heaven next year. And then I wanted to show you something that I haven't shown you before, I don't think. And this is the side concrete walkway on the west side that goes to the front. And right now I've got just all sorts of things stored along the edge until we get the garage situated and the backyard situated. Um, a lot of this will go away. I don't need all of it, but until everything's in place and I kind of stage how I want the backyard to look, it's just hidden away here. But this is also how we can traverse from the backyard to the front yard and from the front yard to the backyard. And it's kind of a nice little hidden area. I do have to be careful back here to empty out all of these containers of water after all of the rain so they don't become places for the mosquitoes to reside. And this is a perfect example. So with that, I will just leave you as it's starting to get pretty noisy. And I hope you enjoyed this walkabout, Sans Stewart but it does give you an idea of just how it is for me in the morning, in the cool of the morning when I can walk around with my coffee cup, which by the way, is typically always muddy because I'm holding it with my right hand, which also is my primary weeding hand. You guys have a great Wednesday. So I am beyond thrilled with the way these steps are turning out. They're going to be 
grand. They may seem a little bit overscaled for the backyard, but that's exactly what I wanted to almost have them be a terrace that you kind of navigate down into the backyard. The treads, treads will not be, they will be wide and the rise will not be nearly as steep as it was in the past. And as you can see, some of you had asked, but there will be steps in all directions, steps to the garage, the steps will continue down into the yard and even, even over into the side around to the gate. And then I'll have a planting pocket in here by where kind of an outdoor kitchen area will be. So this is the vantage point from inside. And now from the back, this drain pipe will be buried there will be a charming enclosure built for the air conditioner. Very noisy back here. I had to take a little break there, but you can see what the steps are gonna look like from the west side. They're going to be concrete with brick-faced risers. And I think they're really gonna be gorgeous. Now, obviously, I will stage them with some of my plants, some of my topiary, though the backyard in general is gonna be um, more serene than the front. There's not gonna be nearly as many plantings. What plantings there are will largely be vegetables, uh, things growing up along the walls, in raised beds. This is all about creating kind of an outdoor living room and this then if you will would be the grand staircase that comes down into the backyard so in this case in the front it's very much plant dominant um, and back here not so much this is more of like an outdoor living room so then imagine if you will when those casement windows are open and yes, it will create issues with flies and things, so we'll have to be careful about when we open them, when we don't. But even the slightest breeze will make cubs happy. And we'll also, from an aesthetic and design standpoint, break up the expanse of that very 1950s looking window, which doesn't in any way match the vintage of the house because there are casement windows um, in other areas. One of them being my bathroom. And here's what they look like from the backyard itself. So they're gonna be beautiful from every vantage point. Right now, though it's subject to change, inside right behind that plyboard wall, that will be a little garden area and I will be planting in there uh, probably a magnificent Japanese maple that will grow and arch over the window and provide a little bit of shade. This is also a design feature that I loved so much at the other house that I'm copying it. And then for those of you who have really been concerned um, about stability and going up and down the steps, there will be a railing um, right along that edge in front of that piece of plywood that you see and possibly also on the other side. Now I'm not doing that. I won't be doing that right away. I will wait because I also want to put a railing um, in the front yard on those front steps going up from the bottom terrace to the top terrace. And so I'll have all of that done at once. So initially it might look a little bit unfinished on that east edge because there won't be a railing there yet, but ultimately there will be. The other thing I like about where it's kind of chopped off there is that it will provide easy downward progression from the platform, the landing platform, the top, down to the gate in the back, but also it kind of partitions that area underneath the window where the sideboard will be 
into almost a separate room that'll have a little bit more intimacy, a little bit more of a feeling of enclosure, aligning with my principles that even a small garden can be divided up into garden rooms. Say hello, Junior. Hi. Junior has been so patient with me. Have you not? Yeah. In trying, <laughs> yes, okay, they're laughing at me. In getting the curve and the radius just right, but I think it's gonna look stupendous. Do you guys agree? And they are a joy to work with. Uh, they did the front, the front sidewalk and the front porch and all of that. And you guys have been just a joy to work with. And I've tried to help keep them hydrated. So from this angle and coming in the back fence, you can see that I'll be able to not have to travel very far at all to go up the back steps. So I will have upward and downward ingress and egress from all sides without making them go completely around because that would take a little bit too much real estate and it would also deprive me of the opportunity to plant in there something that will really soften this space. I also just received, it's on the front porch right now, and that's the rain barrel that I bought. And it will go behind where that chair is right now, that wicker chair in the corner, it will be attached to that. And then we'll attach a hose or something to it so I'll be able to water my plantings in the back. So in short order, I believe next week, Kayla will be able to start on the brick patio. And that work will go pretty fast. And then I may or may not do any planting for another month or two, just depending on how hot it is. And it is hot and very humid. This area is also going to be modified somewhat, and I won't go into that with too much detail right now, but let's just say that eventually the design, the ribbon and repetition of the materials along this east side will all match, and I will do something of a throw rug underneath that bench and then pretty much once the backyard is finished it will be an unbroken circular passage all of the way around the cottage without having to go on to the lower terrace and by fall i hope it's complete well this has been i know kind of a choppy wednesday walkabout but I did want to show you kind of an update on some things and what it looks like from my perspective as I walk about in the mornings.